to make some noise. We about to have some radical worship in here. Are you ready for some radical worship? Come on. Bates, you got to help me tonight. On one accord For no other reason But to worship the Lord This is the day That the Lord has made We will rejoice and be glad Give glory to His name You say We come together On one accord For no other reason For no other reason But to worship the Lord This is the day This is the day That the Lord
Amen. It goes like this. I've had some good days. And I've had some heels to climb. I've had some weary days. Any witnesses in the house? And some sleepless nights. But when I look around, and I think things over. Oh, all of my good days outweigh my bad days and I I won't complain sometimes the clouds hang low and I can hardly see the road and I've asked the question Lord Lord so much pain but he knows what's best for me although my weary eyes they cannot see so I'll just say thank you Lord and I I, I won't complain you see, God has been so good to me. He's been good to me. Has he been good to anybody this morning? Better than you of this whole world could ever be. He's been so good to me. He drowned one of my tears away and he turned my midnight into day oh so I'll just say thank you Lord come on look up and tell him thank you I I won't complain you see God So good to me hallelujah he's been good to me come on just look back over your life better than you of this whole world could ever be he's been so good to me he dried every one of my tears away and he turned my midnight into day. Oh, so I'll just say thank you, Lord. Every time I'm tempted to complain, thank you, Lord. When things aren't going my way, thank you, Lord. Sometimes up and sometimes down, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I I won't complain. God has been so good to me. I just wonder if I had about three people that he's been good to. He's been good to me. Hallelujah. Better than you of this whole world could ever be. He's been so good. I said he's been so good to me. He dried every one of my tears away. Hallelujah. Turn my midnight into day. So every time I'm tempted to complain, I just think back about how good he's been in my life and say, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, I won't complain. 
end. Hallelujah. Come on, give them a praise. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Williams, and as always, I greet you with Jesus joy. It is always exciting to bring you the word on Wednesday in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day sometimes, we'd like to bring you the word. Listen, sit down, relax, get ready to hear a word, call somebody, let them know the word is coming, and I'll see you on the other side of the worship experience. Hey, Y'all ready for the word? Yeah. All right, I'm ready to preach it. Join hands with those around you now as we prepare with prayer for God's word after we will have prayed remain on your feet for the reading of God's word let's pray God thank you for being an awesome God thank you for being a good God a merciful God a gracious God and above all a redeeming and liberating and delivering God we thank you for Jesus without whom we would not have eternal life full and free we thank you for one another God we ask that you would bless the hand of the persons who we hold, bless their lives, and everybody connected to them, Lord. Bless them. They may not even be living right, Lord, but bless them and let the others be blessed just because they know somebody that's blessed. <laughs> bless them until they finally turn around and face you face to face and finally give their lives to you. Now, God, we want to hear from you. We need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, we don't know what we will do. So God, forgive us of our sins as we consecrate ourselves now and make ourselves ready to hear your word. We pray, God, that as I sow the seed of your word, that it would find good ground on the soil of our soul. And with time and tending, bring forth the fruit of the character and conduct of Christ. Because Lord, we want to be like Jesus in our hearts. Finally, God, I pray for me. God, you called me, you know all about me. Let no flaws, faults, or failures in me here under the free-flowing movement of your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, don't penalize your people for anything in me that is not like you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and if there be any wicked way in me, cast it out and lead me in the way that is eternal. Take my mind, Lord, and think with my mind, my mouth, Lord, and speak with my mouth. It may be my voice, but let it be your words, I pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And God, we will be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory for you and you alone. Worthy of the highest praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' mighty and magnanimous name, we ask it. For his sake, we do pray all who agree with this prayer, say amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time for the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible with you or your Bible app, turn or tap there to John uh, chapter 16 and verses 19 through 22. John 16, 19 through 22. Let's see what the Spirit has to say to the church today. John 16, 19 through 22. Amen. I hope y'all had a good, nice, safe, respectable uh, derby. <laughs> Hope you had a good time during derby time. And uh, hope you had some family and friends come down and visit you and hang out with you doing derby. Wherever you went, whatever you did, hope you had a good time. Anybody got a chance, had a chance to come this weekend, this past weekend for worship? Raise your hand if you have right here. We had church, didn't we? I mean, on purpose. Amen. We had church on purpose. It was good. It was good. Derby church. We had derby church. We had. John, John 16, if you found it, say amen. Beginning with verse 19, if you would turn there in the New International Version of the Greek text, you'll find these words. It reads like this. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. 
A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So, with you, now is your time of grief. Right now, you're going through labor pain. But I'll see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. That's good. You may be seated, brother of the Lord. Now, I just want to talk to you simply from the subject, from sorrow to joy, from sorrow to joy. Amen. Help me preach this. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's able to take you from sorrow to joy. Amen. Amen. Look at your other neighbor. Look at him. Tell him it might be dark now, but joy is coming in the morning. If you believe it's true, give God praise. From sorrow to joy. There are many things about the master's ministry that moves me, but one of the things that moves me deeply as I read the scriptures over and over again is the relationship that Jesus has with his disciples. It is so intimate. Jesus loves them so completely, so perfectly, so warmly, compassionately, so truthfully, and so tenderly. And it is not more illustrated than it is as we move to our text. In fact, this text, the context of the text is that Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for his crucifixion and departure. And what's so moving about it is that Jesus knows that he's about to be crucified. He understands that he's about to suffer as no man ever has suffered or will suffer. He's about to experience the most excruciating and humiliating ordeal of his young life. And yet, even though Jesus is about to suffer as no man ever has or ever will suffer, Jesus has a mind lifted above his own suffering and is concerned about his disciples. He does not think, or is at least not so preoccupied with the anticipation of his own personal suffering, that he does not care about the experience that his disciples will have when he is crucified. So Jesus is going to great pains to prepare them for what is about to happen. And I almost said, to prepare them for the inevitable. But it isn't inevitable in the sense that Jesus has a choice. He does not have to go to Calvary. Now he has to go to redeem us, but he doesn't have to choose to. But he chooses to choose. In fact, he said it like this, no man takes my life, I lay it down. So the songwriter was right. It wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross. He said, I could call legions of angels to come get me. It was love that kept him on the cross. And so this loving Christ who's about to be crucified knows that his disciples don't have a clue about this crisis, this critical moment that is upon them, so he seeks to prepare them for what is about to take place. He's already eaten with them the Lord's Supper or the communion or the Passover then. In the upper room, they have sung him and left. Jesus is already in anticipation of what's about to happen, told them that somebody is going to betray him, another is about to deny them. The disciples are asking, is it, is it I, is it I? Jesus is trying to prepare them by telling them about the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit, that God is going to bring the Spirit 
In fact, later on he says, if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. I got to go so that the comforter will come. So sometimes God has to subtract in order to add. Sometimes he has to take away in order to bless you. Sometimes you got to move one thing so he can add another. And if you're not careful, you'll be so preoccupied with what he took that you won't see what he had. Jesus knows they're going to hurt, they're going to grieve, they'll be puzzled and confused and bewildered and befuddled. And so he begins to try to calm them in anticipation of what is about to happen. He says in chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I'm going to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself so that where I am, there ye may be also. It is then that Thomas is confused. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? He said, I'm the way. He said, I'm the truth, I'm the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. And then in chapter 15, he begins to teach them about staying not just connected, but staying in communion. I'm the vine, he says. You're the branches. Abide in me. My word, abide in you. You will bear fruit. And he says, and you're going to be pruned. And when I cut you, I ain't trying to hurt you. Because I'm trying to help you. I prune you so that you might bear more fruit. He said, but you've got to stay connected and in communion because without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is trying to prepare them. He tells them about staying connected. He tells them again about the Spirit of God and the fact that another comforter is coming so that he can not just be with them but be in them. And then Jesus gets to this passage of Scripture in chapter 16, because he's talking about leaving, and they still don't get it. But Jesus understands that I'm going to tell them now. I'm going to pour into them now. And they may not get it now, but they'll understand it better by and by. And it is true that after his resurrection, they look back on everything that he taught, and they said, now we get it. Now we see, because sometimes the truth we are taught, we don't understand until after we look in the rear view mirror of circumstances and experience, and then we say, oh, now we see. It's kind of like when your parents used to tell you something when you were a teenager and you weren't trying to hear them. Because you know when you're a child, your, your parents know everything. <laughs> And then when you become a te teenager, your parents don't know anything. And then when you get older, you realize they were smarter than you thought. In fact, in fact, when you look back over what they taught you, you said to yourself, you know, if I had listened to my parents, I would not be in the situation I'm in today. Well, Jesus is teaching them now because he knows that they will understand it better by and by. So Jesus is teaching them, and when he teaches them, by the time we get to this text, Jesus has said, you're not going to see me for a while, you won't see me, and then in a little while, you will see me because I'm going to my Father. And they, they're looking at each other and say, you know, well, one of the things about Jesus is that I, he don't talk plain. I wish he would just <laughs> speak plain to us so we can understand what he's talking about. And so they're just kind of over with each other saying, what is he talking about? And Jesus said, are y'all asking each other what I meant when I said, in a little while I'll be gone and you won't see me, and then in a little while you'll see me again because I'm going to my father. And of course, they probably looked wide-eyed and slack-jawed, but Jesus knew what they were talking about. And so Jesus begins to elucidate even further. I, I wish I had time to deal with the rest of the chapter and beyond because it's powerful and even beyond it. But Jesus begins to expostulate on what he was saying to them. And Jesus says to them, yeah, I'm going away. You don't see me now, but you'll see me again. Now, while I'm gone, 
the world is going to rejoice, but you're going to grieve. He said, but when I show up, <laughs> you, your grief will be turned into joy. And then he does this. He says, a woman who's pregnant goes in labor because it's time. Time for the delivery. When she goes into labor, and I understand, because I don't know, <laughs> but I'm told that it's an excruciating experience. I could tell, not from experience, but by watching my wife have a baby, that it doesn't look like it feels too good. And some of y'all know that some of y'all weren't very Christian when y'all were having that baby. <laughs> y'all wasn't, y'all wasn't talking very saved. Y'all threatening people and saying stuff that you ordinarily <laughs> wouldn't say. Y'all just look straight ahead like I ain't talking to you. Go ahead. <laughs> but he says while you're going through it, he said it's, it's necessary. He said you're going through it, the sorrow, but then a baby is born. And the sorrow has turned to joy. In fact, he says that the pain is forgotten, is swallowed up in the joy because the baby has come. He said, that's the way it's going to be for you. I'm going to be gone. There'll be grief. You're going to see me again. And the grief will be transformed into joy. I like this. And he says, and nobody will be able to take away your joy. He says, when you experience this joy, you want to understand what the songwriter meant. This joy I have, the world didn't give it. So the world can't take it away. Now, this particular passage does not allow me, the time doesn't allow me to just unpack the principles that are housed in this particular passage for our own personal practice, but just, just in the remaining moments by the aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit, I won't do my best to try to at least give you what I can based upon this text. It's a powerful text. Notice, he says, that uh, you're going to grieve and then there'll be joy. He doesn't tell them that there's any other way to get to the joy. He says there's going to be grief, then there's going to be joy. So one of the things he's teaching and telling them, one of the principles that arise out of the passage is that uh, some joy has to be preceded by grief, or you can't get there without going through this. That's his why he's trying to tell you that there are certain things in your life, certain blessings that always cost. And there are certain things in life that are valuable and you can't receive them without a cost. There's always a path to the blessing. Yeah, and we don't like to hear that because we don't like anything that costs us anything. Mm -mm. We like something for nothing. Come on. We want the best, but we want it for less. Come on, we want quality goods, but we want them at discount prices. Frederick Douglass says we want rain without thunder and lightning. We want crops without tilling up the soil. We want the beauty of the ocean without the mighty roar of its many waters. We want something, but we want it for nothing. That's why we want to graduate from high school and then in 24 hours be the CEO of a corporation because we want something for nothing. That's why it's difficult these days in part for some people to stay married because they want the benefits of a good relationship without paying the cost to get there. So they spend more time and energy on the wedding than they do the marriage. Because they've been watching too much TV and reading too many Harlequin romance books. <laughs> because they think that you're supposed to walk two inches off the ground all the time just because love 
will take you there. No, if you want a good marriage, it's going to cost you. Why you don't shout when I talk like this? People want opportunities. They want great opportunities, but you will never be able to take advantage of great opportunities without the cost of preparation for the opportunity. You want people to open doors for you, but you ain't ready to walk through it because you got to prepare for that kind of opportunity. People want degrees, but they don't want to go to school. Come on, they want children, but they don't want to raise them. Come on, y'all making me talk like this because y'all looking at me. They, come on, they want children, but they don't want to raise them. They want to be a member of a church but they don't want the responsibilities of membership. Come on. Want to get paid big money, but you come to work late and leave early. Because we want something, but we want it for nothing. But if you want the end result, then you've got to do what comes before the end result. If you want the cross and the crown, it costs you a cross. If you want the gain, it's, there's some pain. If you want glory, there's some gall. So if you want something that matters, something that is valuable, then it costs. Nature teaches us that. Everybody wants a diamond that is flawless and gold that is priceless. And they admire the mighty strength of a majestic oak tree. But a diamond's purity comes as a consequence of coal being under severe pressure. And it is the pressure of the coal that brings about the purity of the diamond. Everybody wants the purest gold, but the purest gold goes through the hottest fire. And everybody is impressed by the mighty oak tree. But that oak tree was not planted a mighty oak tree. It started out as a little acorn. And the acorn had to struggle to become uh, the mighty oak tree. Y'all don't hear me. And everybody wants a life that's like this oak tree, strong, victorious, mighty, rooted, and capable of withstanding storms. But you don't want to go through anything to get there. Because in order for that, that acorn to be that oak tree, it had to be buried. It had to be covered up. Y'all are not hearing me. And some rain had to fall on it. Nobody likes rain. Sun, heat, shine on it, and it had to wrestle its way through what was piled on top of it. Come on. And it had to be so persistent that the same sun that scorched other plants nourished and strengthened this plant. And the same water that washed away other seeds strengthened. What I'm trying to tell you is you've got to go through something and go through it in such a way that what destroys others strengthens you. Oh, man, I wish I could preach this like I feel. it, Because it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. That's why you got to learn how to walk by faith. That's why you got to learn how to trust God. Because you see, one of the things that will tempt you to quit while you're struggling towards your joy or the goal is when the struggle doesn't make any sense when it doesn't seem like there's any meaning to the misery you're going through. When you're going through pain and you don't see no purpose for the pain, it'll make you want to quit, give up on God, or at the very least say, uh, 
Why hast thou forsaken me? But you got to learn that God is so faithful that even if you don't understand what you're going through now, that God is going to make sure that uh, whatever his purpose is, that it will be revealed at the proper time. But in the meantime, you got to trust him through the struggle, through the stress, through the pain, through the perplexities, through being mistreated, through being isolated, through being rejected. Because the joy requires the process. I'm almost finished. But watch this, this joy, if you want to get to the joy, he says, first there's the grief, <laughs> then there's the joy. But watch how he says what he says in the end. Because when he says it, he's saying this, you can't get to the joy without the grief. He says, but even though you gotta get to, go through the grief, he says, when you get to the joy, I'll make sure that the joy is worth the grief you had to go through. Look at your neighbor, I'm almost finished. Look at your neighbor and tell him he'll make it worth your while. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, he'll, he'll make it worth your while. Yeah, when you get to the joy and look back on the pain, you'll say, this was worth that. Now, while you're going through it, since you're not where you're headed, you may not believe that it's worth it, but if you, come on, if you could just hold on and trust it. When you get there, he will make it worth everything you've gone through. You won't think I'm in the Bible. In fact, watch the text, because <laughs> he messes around and uses this analogy of a pregnant woman giving birth. And watch what he says. He says she, she has to go through pain because it's time. <laughs> and, and what he's saying is the pain is the signal that something good is about to happen. Just, I feel like running around the parking lot right now. He says, you are going through it. He says, and I know you're crying. He said, but even God, while the woman is crying, even while she's in pain, she knows in the middle of her pain, that something good is coming from it. Good. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I want you to know that if you can, by the grace of God, struggle through the pain, please know that God is going to make it worth the struggle. Watch what he says. He said, he said, the baby comes, and when the baby gets here, listen to what he says. He says, she forgets the pain. What? That's what he says. He says she forgets the pain. Now, when he says that, he doesn't mean that she forgets that there was pain. She remembers that there was pain. But when the baby gets here, the joy is so good that it bears no comparison to the pain she went through. And it's almost like she forgets it. Can I tell you why he probably says she forgets it? Because watch this, watch how good God makes the end result. The joy is so good that she's willing to do it again. <laughs> Ooh, y'all are missing this. Look. And some of y'all ought to be getting more amens. I got any mothers in here. Mother's Day is right around the weekend. Look, if you got more than one child, then you ought to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> because when you were going through it, you were saying, don't touch me again. <laughs> I'm never going to do this again. And then when the baby got here, and it's so cute, the baby looked just like you. You talking about, you know, I think we ought to have another one. 
and you don't have one, two, three, four kids, what in the world would make you go through that pain again? It's the joy of the end result. And so you may have to struggle to get that business going, but when the business finally is on its feet, it's worth everything that you've gone through. You may have to struggle to get that degree, but the getting to your goal was so much joy that you said, I got my bachelor's, I think I'll go back for my master's. You did it before, and when you were going through it, you said to yourself, once I get through this, I'm never doing this again. But when you started marching across the stage, Come on, and your kinfolk were there, and you know how your folk are, because they tell you to hold your applause until everybody's name is called, but your, <laughs> your crazy kinfolk are up clapping, and, and you start considering something you promised you would never do because of the end result. And God is saying, I will never let you go through anything for me for nothing. Look at your neighbor and tell him it pays to serve Jesus. I ain't even making it up. If you go, here's an example. Go to Mark 10, and Jesus said this. Jesus said, no one who has given up home, father, mother, sister, brother, or field for me will not get a hundred more weight in this life and the life to come. Oh, you missed your shout. First of all, when he says that, he's saying, you may have to sacrifice for me now, he said, but I'll make it worth your while now, in this world. Ooh, you missed your shout. That means I ain't got to wait to get to heaven for everything. Some things, he's going to bless me in this world. He says, what you lost, he said, I'll give it to you a hundred times. He said, you left your home and your kinfolk, your brothers and your sisters, your mother and father don't want to have anything to do with you because you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. He said, I'll give you a hundred more. Because when you come to a church, he says it's going to be full of potential mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and nieces. Come on in here. I bet you if I pass the mic around, there's somebody in here who says, you know what, I ain't got much of a relationship with my biological family. He said, but they will tell you, but I got close relationships with some people in here. And watch this. Uh, one of them is by biology. The other is by blood. <laughs> Y'all have missed it. See, one biology is the physical blood, but the other is the blood of Jesus. And there's some folk who have closer relationships to people who they have no biology with than they do with folk who they grew up with. Because God won't let you, for him, go through anything without a blessing. He won't do it. Now, I said for him. Somebody say for him. Because it depends on what path you take. Because the enemy is always promising you stuff too. He said, if you bow down, I'll give you, he said this to Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. He said, all you, all you got to do is bow down to me. In other words, if you do it my way, I'll get you what you want. He said, man, and on the way there, you're going to have the time of your life. That's what the devil said. And it's often the opposite of what Jesus said. Jesus said, you may have to pay now. It may cost you now, but I'll pay you later. The enemy just tells you, I'll pay you now, but he doesn't tell you what it'll cost you later. <laughs> Prodigal son left the house. I want my stuff. I want my inheritance. All he could think about is what he's going to experience with his inheritance. You can't make me believe his daddy didn't try to talk him out of it. But you know, sooner or later, give you what you want. Left the house, got in the fast lane with his fast friends. Footloose and fancy free. 
just squandering everything he had until at last he was badly broke. He was nearly naked, excruciatingly hungry, and shamefully employed tending swine in Gentile territory. Now, that's where he ended up. On the way there, as long as his pockets were fat, he had plenty of friends. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me. And look, you always will have plenty of friends if the drinks are always on you. <laughs> I'm trying to get it where you can understand what I'm saying. I mean, you didn't need that, but your cousin, if you want to explain it to your cousin, you can use that one. You always have friends when you got stuff. And he was having the time of his life, but he didn't know what it would cost him. He ended up in a pig pen. He ended up doing something he never thought he would do. Because that's the way the liar, the adversary, the enemy, the devil, Beelzebub is. He's the liar and the father of lies. In other words, uh, lie is his native tongue. He speaks lie like you speak English. If, he's, if his mouth is moving, he's lying. But he never tell you what it's going to cost you. And so the prodigal says, the Bible says he came to himself. He said, I have been a fool. And the wonderful thing about the parable is that he survived his foolishness. See, it's a wonderful parable because he gets to come home. But you better pay attention. Everybody doesn't survive their foolishness. Watch this. So if you're in the middle of your foolishness and you know it, don't wait. Turn around now. Because everybody doesn't just survive the far country. God, I wish I could preach this like I feel it. But you will never sacrifice without God paying you. He said, I'm going to make it worth your while. In this life and, somebody say and, and, in the life to come. And this is important. Because every believer needs to remember that this is not all there is. And if you remember that this world is not all there is, but that there is another world, then you can understand why some things seem unresolved in this world. But God doesn't put a period at the end of this world. He puts a comma at the end of this world. And you don't stop at commas, you just pause and then move on. Which means that there may be some things in this world that we do not understand. I do not understand suffering, but I do know that suffering does not have the last word. That the central nervous system is not the final arbiter of truth. Look at your neighbor and tell him, God ain't finished. So even if you have to suffer for him in this life, he'll make it worth your while, not just in this life, but in the world to come. That's why you got to walk by faith. Ain't that good news? Look at your other neighbor and tell him it pays to serve him. He, he's faithful. He won't let you down. In fact, not only will he make it worth your while down the road, God, but he has a way of making it worth your while on the way. Anybody in here can testify that while you're on your personal pilgrimage, he'll punctuate your pilgrimage with periods of joy. Somebody said, the joy of the Lord is my strength, which means that when God punctuates your personal pilgrimage with periods of joy, it's the joy that helps you get through to the next situation. My God, I know I'm right about it. Okay, I got to quit. Y'all look tired. And I'm running out of time. But can I, can, you got time for one more? Yeah. Watch this, watch this. <laughs> watch this. I like this because of what God is able to do. Because he's not just omnipresent and omniscient, know everything. Not omnipotent, has all power. But he's omni-creative. Omni means all. He's omni-capable. 
he's omni-able. Watch this, watch the text. Because what shouts me in this text is not just everything I taught you, but this last thing blows my mind. Because I want you to notice what he says. He says, the, the woman gets pregnant because it's time. She has the baby. And when she has the baby, the baby uh, it brings the joy. And the baby makes everything that happened worthwhile. Now he says, he's, you, you grieving now. You're going through the birth process now. He says, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Did you catch it? He says, this is what shouts me. He says, your sorrow will be turned to joy. <laughs> he didn't say, I'm going to replace your sorrow with joy. He can do that. He does it all the time. But here in this text, he shows us something else. It isn't that I'm going to replace your sorrow with joy. I'm going to transform your sorrow into joy. <laughs> now, I know that doesn't make sense to you, but let's go back God, to this birth analogy that Jesus uses. <laughs> Jesus says, you see the baby, and the baby brings so much joy that you forget about the pain. So the source of the joy is the baby. But the same thing that was the source of the joy is the thing that caused the pain. When the baby was being born, it was the coming of the baby that caused the agony of the mother. So the thing that's hurting her now is going to bless her later. And what I'm trying to tell you is God is so much God. He's so good that God can not only give you joy by replacing what caused you pain, but God can give you joy by using the thing that gave you pain and let it bring you joy. God can take what caused the pain and let it be the source of your power. He can take what caused the struggle and make it be the source of your strength. God can take the thing that caused you to go through something bad and use that thing to make you better. I, I thought I would get more amens than that. God doesn't have to change it or replace it. God can use it. And it will be the source of your joy. Y'all looking at me like that, that cannot be the case. Just think about your life and think about certain things in your life that caused you pain, but now are the source of your joy. And listen, the ultimate expression of this, because I'm running out of time, is the cross. Because Jesus is trying to prepare them for the fact that he is about to be crucified. And when they see him crucified, it will cause them grief while he's hanging on the cross. But when he comes down off the cross, it's put in the tomb and gets up Sunday morning and they see him again and they have joy and they look back at the cross and its meaning, the same cross that gave them grief is now the source of their joy because if he hadn't died, we couldn't live. The Roman cross was a place that was, was a cursed way and place to die. But God has taken the cross in the mind of a believer and transformed this symbol of murder and agony and suffering into deliverance, liberation, and redemption. That's why you wear a cross around your neck. That's why some of you got tats that are crossing because God has taken something evil, God, and has brought good out of it. So every time you see Calvary, it makes you shout because if it hadn't been for the, oh, y'all don't hear me. You wouldn't be on your way. Is there anybody in here who's lying about Calvary? At the cross, 
at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. And since the cross is the source of my joy, every time trouble comes, when I look at the cross, trouble can't take away my joy. Because trouble can't take away what Jesus did for me on Calvary. So I might be broke, but I still got joy. My friends might turn their back on me, cause I, but I still got joy. I might have a pink slip on the job, but I still got joy. Because no matter what happens to me, it can't change my relationship with God. This joy I have, the world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. If that blessed you, give God some praise. We hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message, and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a Christian, a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If you want to be saved and have new life in Jesus Christ, pray this prayer, Lord, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you, for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours. Amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you want to become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now, and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen, and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you. Praise the Lord. I hope and pray that that word blessed you. We're always excited about bringing you the word virtually. And listen, one of the reasons why we're able to do that is because we have faithful members and we have friends of Base Memorial who give religiously and regularly uh, so that we can bring this particular ministry to you. If you would like to give as well, and this is also for our members who are watching who want to give their tithes, offering or sacrificial giving now, there's several ways you can do it. We try to make it as easy as possible. First of all, you can give by cash app, dollar sign, Bates Memorial. It'll go right to our account. You can uh, text to give and the information should be on your screen. Details there. Follow those instructions and we'll get it as well. You can also go to the website, basememorial.com. Click on to the giving tab. Follow the brief instructions. It ought to, uh, it'll take you right to what you ought to do. And or if you'd like to, you could stop by at your leisure. While you're out, you can stop by, drop off your offering with your gift in it, and we'll make sure it gets where it's supposed to get. If none of those work and you want to just mail it in, the address should be on your screen. It's 620 East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203 Bates Memorial Baptist Church right at the top. And we'll make sure that it gets right where it's supposed to go. What's up, Bates Memorial family and friends? Listen, this is the year that we're serving with a made up mind. And we've got a lot that you can get involved in. Check this out. Attention all ministry leaders. Please mark your calendar and join us for Bates Leadership Team Meeting. This meeting is for ministry leaders only. Hey Bates family, it's Minister John here with Christian Education. Look, I have an exciting announcement for all those people who have yet to complete their new member classes. We are having another Super Saturday. It's going to be May 29th at 8 a.m. Meet us there virtually. If you want to know what it means to be a, a church member, if you want to know what it even means to be a disciple or why we exist as a church, this is your opportunity. Why don't you go ahead and register at the link in this post and join us for virtual 
Super Saturday. Uh, it's our way of uh, consolidating all of our new member classes into one. That's right. You can finish all nine new member classes in one day. Just register and we would hope that you join us uh, for Super Saturday, May 29th. That's all I have. Be blessed. Hello, Bates family. This is Reverend Walter Holden Jr., the Associate Pastor of Congregational Care and Family Life Connections. Last year, we found ourselves thrust into a wide variety of changes, precautions, restrictions due to the pandemic. However, and throughout all this, the challenges of life continue to transpire. Now, because of our love for our members and their families, we want you to know we are committed to being there for you whenever humanly possible. With that being said, we want you to know the best way for us to know when something is going on with you is for you to notify us. So whether in person or not, we encourage you to contact us whenever death or any other tragedy strikes so that we can journey with you as you navigate and adjust to the changes life has brought your way. To, to contact us, you can call the church at 502-636-0523. Drop us an email at bmbc at basememorial.com or contact me personally at wholder at basememorial.com. Remember, we love you all and want to be there to support and assist you at your time of need. So please let us know. Until then, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. And our prayer is for God to continue to bless and keep you all. Hey, what's happening, church family? The songwriter just says, do you know what today is? It's our anniversary. Guess what? This is marks of excellence. This is a blessing. This is a major impact that the church and the community is all about. Can you join us? Please join us here at the church June the 5th for a photo shoot at 12 p.m. And also that following week, June the 12th at 1230 for the actual service that we all will be excited and blessed to see our people go to the next level. I hope you're excited. I'm excited. We're excited. Join us. God bless you. That's what's going on here at Bates Memorial, and we want you to get involved. We are very excited about being able to do this for you, and we're able to do it as a consequence of your faithfulness. Listen, we love to end with a prayer and a blessing, a benediction, so let's do that now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what our eyes have seen, ears have heard, and hearts have felt. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for the power of your word. Your word is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light into our pathway. I pray that you would bless everyone under the sound of my voice in Jesus name. Amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace and give thee peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time.